Well, it's a great honor to be here today at a TED Talk. This is something I didn't really expect to do. Um, I guess I was introduced as the kid of you know, all the speakers here earlier. Um, I'm actually, as mentioned, the president of the University of Saskatchewan Space Design Team, and uh, this is a subject I'm very much passionate about, so I hope that I can share that with you today. Um, fortunately, Dave actually reintroduced the idea of you know, becoming an astronaut. So how many people in this audience here have looked up an image similar to this, you know, Apollo 8, most iconic image of all time, and actually dreamt of being an astronaut? I know I have. I'm sure a lot of people here can too. Well, change is on the way. On the way. There's significant problems that currently face us in the industry, but there's solutions that I'm going to propose to you here today that will help us overcome that and unlock the true potential that this industry has, you know, with our civilization and improving our life. So how about the Apollo moment? Almost 50 years ago, we landed somebody on the moon. This is probably the most watched event in human history to this date, um, and inspired an entire generation to become scientists, engineers, and innovators. 50 years ago, it was unimaginable that we would have the ability to communicate to each other around the world instantaneously using things like the internet and global telecommunications. That technology was enabled by the development of spacecraft technology. And today, now although it's fiber, space industry continues to revolutionize the way we work. So why don't I just cut to the chase? The next big thing is space. So how about we take a look at what currently impacts our lives that was developed by the space industry and how we don't even recognize the things that's done. In 2011, global space industry revenue was $287.77 billion. Now, to put that in scale, a number that we can understand, that's about the same amount of money that the Canadian government is going to be spending using your tax dollars. That's about a tenth the size of the global telecommunications industry. So by no small stretch does this industry have a huge impact on our lives. And that's done in many different ways. Earth observation technology is used in weather forecasting. Navigation. Anybody here use GPS to get around? I would be lost without it. Telecommunications. You know, without having satellites in orbit, we wouldn't necessarily be able to communicate to each other around the world, like I mentioned earlier. And finally, scientific pursuit. Uh, if anybody watched the Mars Curiosity Lander, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, the idea of us exploring beyond. And that's all technology that's, you know, relatively new that's really innovated a lot of different fields. Here's one example. Earth observation. Now, I was actually growing up in Winnipeg at the time that this occurred. This is an image here of the Red River flooding. I heard a story a couple days ago that's actually really interesting, that 50 years ago when the Red River flooded, they didn't have this capability, obviously because the technology was in its infancy, but they didn't necessarily know how flooding affected the landscape and where it was going to occur. But using an image like this, what they were able to do was predict not only where it was going to happen, but how to prevent future floods. And that saves not only properties, but people's lives. The same technology, as I mentioned earlier, helps in weather forecasting, but goes beyond that. You're talking about things like spy satellites, which are used obviously for national defense, mineral exploration. I'm from Saskatchewan. We have a lot of mining up there. You know, and a lot of that's enabled by us taking satellite imagery to find out where to explore. And remote sensing in general has brought us revolutions in the field of medical imaging, just because of the optic systems we had to develop. So in the theme of taking risks, I'm going to make two bets with you guys here today. By 2025, what's the scale of this industry going to be and how is it going to impact our lives? By the end of this year, if you have the money to do it, Virgin Galactic, which is Richard Branson's uh, space company, is actually going to be sending up people for about $200,000 in suborbit. So for that amount of money, what you get to do is experience weightlessness. Uh, ultimately, what's going to happen is that's going to drive down costs in the long term, and everyday people are ultimately going to be able to afford it in a couple years. But there's a couple things that are holding us back from really unlocking our true potential with this industry. I'm going to only list three here today because I think they're the main ones. And that's cost, technological life cycle, and bureaucracy. Cost is fairly simple. The amount of energy it takes to get out of the Earth's gravitational well is too high. And really what that means is that the amount of fuel and therefore cost, you know, dollars we have to spend, ends up being 
far too great for us to really achieve anything beyond low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit. The second concept somewhat related to that, tech life cycle. Could you imagine that 50 years ago, you know, we'd have mainframe computers be shrunk down to the size of a smartphone? That's something that was quite unimaginable to most of the engineers at the time there. In fact, I think there's a quote out there that says, there was only gonna be about three people in the world who could actually use computers because they cost too much and they took up too much room. But nowadays, obviously, that's, that would be crazy to say. This industry is the same way. It's prime for change, but we're still stuck in the Stone Age. We still use the same technology that Von Braun invented in the 1940s and 50s. So ultimately, if we're gonna wanna go forward and do anything in this industry, what we're gonna have to do is really change the way we think. Bureaucracy is another simple concept. Ideas don't come from one place. Ideas can come from here. Ideas can come from somewhere in Europe, maybe somewhere in Asia. But even the can or Canada and the US working together on certain projects is impeded by different regulations. And that's primarily to restrict the sale of missile technology to unfriendly nations. Outside of cooperation, we also have the issue of competition. As an entrepreneur, it's very hard to raise the initial capital to enter an industry like this. So you're not only limiting cooperation, you're limiting competition. Those are the two main drivers in any industry that an economist will tell you will help bring innovation. So that's something that's gonna need to change. I'm gonna give you a couple of case in points. The first is the space shuttle. $450 million for each launch on average. That's quite a bit of money, and that's obviously money that that entrepreneur can't necessarily raise for himself. Well, space and, uh, sorry, the space shuttle was supposed to offer us a unique solution to the problem of getting things in low Earth orbit. Over 40 years, the program cost $196 billion, did not reach its intended goal of driving down the cost, was not launched you know, upwards of 10, 20 times a year as initially planned. And the cost is about $10,000 a kilogram versus where we would need to get it at about $100 a kilogram. So this is a system that, although had many great innovations in itself, ultimately did not accomplish the goal of bringing down the cost of spaceflight. And here's another one. E um, sorry, European Space Agency Artemis satellite, billion dollar flagship satellite. It was finished in 1995. It took six years before it was actually launched and actually didn't reach its intended orbit. So this satellite, which had many, many years of development, testing, everything else put into it, had to wait six years till 2001 before it could actually be used. In that time frame, imagine how much change occurred. This was a communication satellite. In the 1990s, the advance of the internet, fiber optics, you know, lasers, everything else, completely revolutionized, uh, revolutionized the way we do things. So this was very obsolete before it was even launched, and we still had to wait. Obviously, if you're investing this much money into something, you're not gonna take a lot of risk. So that's where the solutions come in. So this is something that um, actually the USST, the organization I've been involved with, uh, takes you know, very dear to their heart. This is an artistic rendering of a space elevator. And for people who aren't familiar with the concept, the idea is basically having an elevator cable strung between here and geosynchronous orbit. And the idea behind it is you put the fuel on Earth instead of bringing it along with you and therefore drive down the cost. So you use something called wireless power beaming, which is this idea of using laser beams to beam power to a climber, and that climber takes things into orbit. This is obviously in the realm of science fiction, but there was a NASA competition started in 2005 that the USSC was involved in that we were ultimately very successful in and won numerous times. In fact, we still had world records up until I believe last year in the field of wireless power beaming because we were able to show that we could take things up, we could leave the power source back on Earth and carry things up, about a kilometer in this case, in that competition. But I'm not proposing this necessarily as a solution. This is a, an idea here that is different than what is currently being used. And ultimately, that's what we need to do. We need to dream up new ways of doing things if we want to actually achieve that goal of $100 a kilogram. Here's another idea, a nanosatellite. This is something that the USSC was also working on uh, for the past couple of years. The satellite, unlike those billion dollar flagship satellites, which are the size of buses, is in fact only about this big. I'll give you a scale of it. 
And the idea behind this is that you have a shorter life cycle, you're taking less risk, you know, you're not putting up the billion dollars, smaller capital investment, and you can try new technology. So it's like computers now. You're miniaturizing everything, you're speeding up the rate of development. So unlike that computer you bought a couple weeks ago, which is already out of date, you know, with this, we're actually gonna be able to try new things and, and see what works without having to go bankrupt as a result. And something like that can be launched on a system like this. There's another Virgin Galactic system called Launcher One. Launcher One, which will be ready in a couple years, already promises to drive down the cost of getting things in a low Earth orbit. So unlike the space elevator, this is no longer science fiction. And that's why I'm here today to convince you that science fiction is becoming science fact. So the USST, we've existed since, uh, since 2005, is an organization run by students. Uh, you know, during the last term here, we had about 50 people involved uh, throughout engineering, computer science, physics, uh, business school, pretty much anybody from across campus joined. We didn't have a billion dollar budget. We still tried to think differently and do new things. And ultimately, that's why we were able to be so successful in what we've done. So how about we talk about the future now? In the future, if we can overcome these barriers, there's gonna be three things that are driving us forward, but we're gonna be able to accomplish a lot of things. There are gonna be societal benefits, economic benefits, and scientific victories. The first is colonization. Everybody knows about the problem of overpopulation. It's obviously something that's gonna be affecting us more and more into the future. Well, it turns out in space, there's a lot of free real estate. The problem is that Nobody really has the resources to develop it right now, obviously. This is an artistic rendering of a moon base. The idea of putting a moon base up in the next couple of years is actually quite interesting. Because the moon has a large reserve of helium-3, unlike the Earth. Helium-3 can be used in nuclear fusion reactions, which is ultimately the same sort of thing that drives the sun, and in the future is likely to be a major energy source. Uh, beyond that, actually, the idea of putting solar farms on the moon or in orbit could allow us to beam down power continuously 24 hours a day, 365, without interference from you know, the atmosphere or having environmental concerns, you know, using that land for power generation instead of growing crops. So you'd end up using solar, uh, sorry, wireless power beaming to accomplish this sort of thing, and that's where you know, this idea generation thing becomes important. Asteroid mining is another big one. And actually, this is something that's being pursued currently by a company called Planetary Resources uh, because of the potential it can provide to us. Instead of having you know, the issue of resource scarcity here on Earth or having certain resources like rare earth minerals being controlled by a small group of nations, which those things are ultimately used in all of our electronics, they're very important, we can go out just beyond Mars to bring back whatever we want. The type of technology we're gonna have to you know, actually develop to get this is you know, gonna be AI technology or robotic systems because we can't control these things from Earth. So the benefit to society is not just having less scarcity, it's the other technology we're gonna have to develop to, to actually get there. And lastly, space manufacturing, and this is the biggest one by far. In a microgravity situation, what you can do is you can produce more pure elements. You can produce more pure crystals, such as this. Insulin grown in space showed more crystalline uh, arrangement, sorry, than insulin crystals grown on Earth. So this technology can be applied to bearings, crystals, semiconductors, uh, anything that's nanotechnology, pharmaceuticals, uh, really anything that requires a high degree of precision. And that's where the real revolution will lie because any materials development in the past 50 years has really led to, ultimately, a lot of different spin-offs. Think of semiconductors developed in the 30s and 40s leading to the transistor. Beyond that, having a manufacturing base in space allows us to explore outer planets a lot easier because we don't need to worry about getting things in orbit. And finally, if we have refining, processing, and manufacturing in space, we don't have the issue of having environmental damage, you know, not in my backyard sort of situation. So there's other benefits associated with doing things like this. So here's the second bet I wanna make you. Is by 2050, if we actually overcome these barriers, how much money are we gonna be making from this? So I guess if I take your money now, I can put it in a savings account if everybody's okay with that. And 
We'll just go from there. After we overcome these barriers, I mean, the possibilities are completely endless. In our galaxy alone, at the scale of it, we'll never be able to see everything. It's ultimately in our nature to explore. Human beings are ultimately very curious. And I think that when we do overcome these barriers, because it will happen in the near future, we'll be able to answer things like whether or not we're alone. So I'm going to leave you with this. Throughout history, great ideas have come from not just the giants, but the innovators. The small guy, the risk takers, the people who went out there and did it. So after we overcome all these barriers, all these obstacles, by taking risk, we're going to need something that drives our human curiosity. And ultimately, I believe that that should be something like this. An image taken from the surface of Mars by humanity's first astronaut to that planet. And by doing that, we'll inspire another generation to go beyond, to explore, to try new things, and to innovate. Thank you.